We've got Imran and Natasha already to rock and roll. Um, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Marlies Richter. I'm from the Mowbray and Rosebank CAN. Um, and I've been asked to facilitate the session this morning. Uh, I'll be up front. I don't know much about pig rearing or duck rearing. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to learning a lot. Um, I want to start off by just a, a couple of housekeeping uh, uh, a couple of housekeeping guidelines. One is to check if uh, there's any objections to us recording the session. Um, we, we, what we do is to record and then put it up on the Facebook page so that people who miss it can, can watch it. And I just have a quick scan if there's any objections. See no objections. Um, and I'll ask Vicky if she will if she will record, please. And oh, it's ready, thank you. And then um, if you don't need to have your camera on, the suggestion to keep it off. It helps with, with containing data costs and to introduce yourself in the chat box. We'll be using the chat box quite a bit. If you have some questions that come up while the speakers are talking, uh, please put that in the chat box. Um, and I'm also going to ask that people use the um, the hand function if you would like to um, if you would like to ask a question um, at the end. Um, my suggestion is that you arrange your screen um, according to speaker view. If you go to the top of your screen, you'll see uh, a button that that talks about how you would like to to see or arrange the the speakers on your screen. Um, the cascade view. Oh, the gallery view is the most useful because then you can see everyone. And also then if you go to the bottom, you'll see a, a button saying chat and participants. And that way you can have the chat box on the right and you can see who the participants are. And there's a, a, a sign there that would ask you to put your hand up if you, um, if you would want to ask a question. I would like to welcome Imran and Natasha, especially this morning. They're going to talk to us a little bit about their experiences um, with small animal rearing. And my suggestion is, Imran, if you want to start us off, uh, you're from Gorilla House and Seed, if you would like to introduce yourself a little bit more in the work that you're involved in, and then please tell us um, about your experiences with, with small animal rearing. Morning, Imran. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and better. Okay, cool. So my name is Imran. Um, I run a, a company called Gorilla House. It's my business partner, Josh. Um, and I also work for an NGO called Seed. And what we do is we teach sustainability training using a framework called permaculture. I'm sure many of you are aware of permaculture. Um, but our focus is basically sustainability training in the urban space. So food growing, auto harvesting, micro livestock like chickens and ducks. Um, anything to do with sustainability in the urban space. And currently for the NGO, we teach um, accredited courses to previously disadvantaged individuals um, in the Western Cape in Mitchell's Plain. Yeah, so I've been asked to speak to you guys about chickens. I'm just going to show you my journey through chicken keeping. So let me just see if I can share my screen. And please let me know if I'm speaking too fast. I often speak too fast when I um, start thinking like a chicken. Okay, it says that um, host disabled participant screen sharing. Is it? Um... Just give me a second, I'll make you co-host. Okay, cool. Good morning to all the, the new participants. Um, we've just started off and Imran is talking to us um, uh, about chicken rearing. Uh, if you would like to introduce yourself in the chat box, and I'm going to ask that you uh, please put yourself on mute and uh, we will ask you to unmute if you, if you have a question. Did that work? Um, you know? Okay, let's see. Okay. Ah, yeah, see. Can you guys see what I'm seeing? It says, yeah, oh, we can see some chickens. 
Okay, cool, 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 cool. Okay, so these were the first chickens that inspired me. This is at my teacher's farm in um, Lady Smith. Her name's Alex Kruger. Um, so I went to a farm right after I did my permaculture course in 2015. So these chickens, I started making chicken sours and I knew I wanted to get chickens back home. Um, let's see if I can go next, yeah. Okay, so this is me coming back from there, constructing my first little coop, very simple. This is all waste hood. Um, that's the coop inside, and then got the first batch of chicken. So these are Bantam silkies. They're small breed, a very docile breed. They're often bred for the for for shows. Um, so very pretty birds, very prized birds. But they make nice urban birds because they're not very loud and they're very friendly. Um, so this is the reason why I went for this breed in the beginning. This is a little structure. And my first big learning lesson was that they don't like the sun. They don't like to get too hot. I came out one day and they were all sitting inside here with their beaks open. It was a hot, sunny day. And I had to um, hose them all down and just spray them with water just to cool them. I thought I was going to lose them all. And then I put up a little makeshift uh, shade cloth structure over it. So please, when you are designing and planning your chicken systems, they, they die from overheat. It's one of the big killers of chickens. So the, ideally in a shaded space, in a forested area, food forest. Um, yeah. And then I got ducks. I started wanting to mix up the nutrient profiles in the um, manure that they were given, the bacterial families, because they all attract different bacterial families. So I'd get in ducks. Also saw that when I got ducks, that um, their poop is much wetter, which makes for a nice mix in a compost system because it's already got the moisture. So I got some ducks and these are Indian runner ducks. Very nice for the urban space because they can't really fly. Um, so you don't have to worry about them flying away, but they do run, they run quite fast. Okay, uh, so it's just two ducks to start off with. What I found about ducks is that in the urban space, they are much louder, much more aggressive. They eat much more food. So like about a year or so ago, I actually let go of all of my ducks. Um, first time experimenting with chickens, free ranging in the garden. So this is after um, a season of harvest and some cover crops and they come through and they clean the whole space of all the pests, all the organic matter. And I found it really exciting, really effective that you could use animals to do that work, which is quite labor intensive. Eggs from the ducks, which is a very um, much richer, much um, bigger egg. And often your, your chefs like to use duck eggs. Um, so there's a, there's a nice market for eggs as well. Then went on to building another structure, moving the chickens into the food forest here at the back. Um, this is called the geodome. So a lot of what we do at Kudalaus is very experimental, um, trying to just see what are all the systems out there that can um, get one towards self-sustainability. We looked up what is the easiest, cheapest way to enclose a space and we came across geodomes and it looked super simple to make. So we decided to do it because of the southeaster that rips through my yard um, and often also leaves them quite, um, yeah, they, they need shelter. The animals need shelter from, from the elements. Okay, so this was the dome that we put together and then fenced up a little area for them so they could have a, 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 a run basically to walk in. Prior to that, I would let them out every day into the entire garden. But when it comes to animals free ranging in your garden systems, there's also a bit of management that needs to take place unless you've got enough vegetation for them to um, range. Otherwise, they'll just they'll, they'll decimate everything. Okay, so they're now in this area, which is a mix of the chicken system as well as a composting area, which you'll see on the side there. And they love compost. There's some models out there where you can actually just feed chickens um, compost, compost material, the bugs, the organic matter in there. Um, because feed grain um, is one of the biggest costs of keeping chickens. But they love compost. Um, and you can get away with feeding them just with compost. However, I must caveat that with you need to be able to source a good amount of organic matter on a consistent basis. So for about 30 chickens, I saw a model where they were putting together one cubic meter of fresh organic material every week. And they were getting, they were able to sustain their, their chicken flock. Okay. So these are still the bantams. And then we started getting more ducks in. Um, 
But again, the ducks are quite loud and quite quite noisy in a small urban space. Um, okay, these are just uh, more chicken coop designs. But that's it. I've, that's all I wanted to show you guys. Um, but it's super simple to keep chickens. This is, this is on a farm in Goed Gedacht. We have first came across different chicken coops and that. They just need shelter from the elements. They need an adequate amount of feed. Um, and you've got to decide on what are you keeping them for? Like what's your primary goal with keeping chickens? For me, it was to be the, the drivers of fertility on the site because they can take organic matter and make it into very um, fertile uh, manure. Um, and the eggs and any potential meat or anything else is, is a secondary byproduct. Um, but yeah, they are, they are, what I'm looking at at the moment is getting into now profitable farming. So not just backyard urban homesteading, um, but actually how do we make a profitable farming business with uh, or regenerative farming business with chickens. And there are a couple of models out there, especially the pasture days. I'm going to show you guys. Uh, do I have still a lot of time or how much time do I have left? I feel like I'm talking. Uh, please, please go ahead, Imam. You still have five minutes. Okay, okay, cool. So just to show you where my focus is now, everyone. So Farm Angus, some of you might have heard of him he's based in Speed, if I'm not mistaken. I'm yet to go out to his space and check out his farm. But this is a model that um, uses or that follows pasture-raised um, animal keeping. So they're basically um, being fed a lot of field or grass yeah so they're moving these chicken tractors they move on to fresh grass every single day um and this is how this copies the natural pattern of um chicken well of, of livestock it did in basically um where you've had cattle which was being followed or ruminants followed by um, um poultry or birds and this two this combination with the grasslands generated a, the most fertile soils and was able to support the most amount of animal mass in our entire history on earth. You look at the vast um, um, savannas or you look at the, the mass buffalo herds of the Americas, those are all sus uh, sustained on grasslands and only recently, I mean I heard about this before, but only re recently started getting very really excited by the fact that animals and grass systems as one of the quickest, way to, quickest ways to regenerate the landscape and build biomass. Um, and it can also be quite profitable. So where my focus is at the moment is showing or trying to seek out and create models of profitable farming. Because I feel like only that, once we can show those models, that will start to inspire our youth, especially to start to carve out livelihoods in, in the regenerative farming, basically. And, and that's when we'll start to see mass adoption. It's got to be profitable as well, but ecologically and ethically profitable. So cool thing about Farmer Ag Angus is that uh, on his website, on his blog, he actually open source plans for his model, um, which I'll drop a link, and I'm gonna drop this link into the group. Just check it out, but he, he put a whole spreadsheet together of all his costs for the past five years, and really, really cool, very helpful guy. Um, and um, yeah, I'm learning a lot about this model from his website with the chat. Yeah, let me drop it in the chat. Um, and this is based off a model. Let's see if I can exit that. This is based off a model by a guy called Joel Saladin. So if you search him, I'll drop his PDF in the in the chat box as well but he kind of popularized this grass-fed farming model and you can see it's all these very low cost simple um, tractors moving across the landscape and they also do like beef they do sheep um, turkeys all those kind of things um, this is much healthier for the bird you can regenerate in the landscape you're not concentrating when you're in one spot but you spread it across the landscape in um, doses that the landscape can handle so let me drop his is book in the in the chat group as well really really inspiring very simple easy read as well um okay i'll drop that in now Imran, i see that there's quite a few people asking questions in the chat okay. um could i suggest that is there anything else that you still want to cover in terms of shared screen 
that's that was the gist of what I wanted to share. Yeah. Perfect. Um, but you mind if we go? If you stop sharing your screen, and we're going to go to the chat. Um, cause there's mm -hmm. lots of questions that your, your discussion has generated. Um, okay. could we ask you, uh, to just tell us about where Gorilla House is situated? Um, and then there's also a question about discussing the urban predator. Um, if you want to tell us a little bit more about that. Okay. Um, so where Gorilla House is based, we based in, we have two sites, my sites in Sari State. And then we've got another site, my business partner, Josh, moved at the end of last year to Hout Bay. So it's a nice size farm that we're trying to, or he's trying to establish. Um, and the urban predator, where's the urban predator? Rats, is it rats? So there's a question about, uh, if you can talk a little bit about urban predators and someone made a contribution about problem uh, with rats. Okay, so urban predators, I think the biggest, of uh, the context that I operate in, the biggest predator are your, your thieves, your human thieves, um, because of the, the value of, of poultry. Um, but other than that, in terms of animals, cats, not a problem, uh, especially the bigger breeds of chickens, they can really defend themselves, they're quite feisty. Um, birds of prey, I've had one problem with, with the predatory bird, I'm not sure what, but I know we've got owls and um, I'm not sure if we've got hawks, but I, I do know we do have some predatory birds in the Western Cape. Um, and then rats, that's our major predatory animal, especially for your chicks and your, your baby birds. Um, so in the urban space, I haven't found a solid solution. The more you, I, don't, I wouldn't say more humane, but the ones where you don't use poison or things like the bucket with peanut butter um, kind of thing. It's just a, a bucket where you've got a, like some peanut butter in and they, they go inside then can't climb out. Um, but yeah, besides that, the, the biggest thing is preventing or ensuring that your space is, is tidy and not attracting um, pests like uh, rats. So grain is in secure bins. It's not just laying all over the place. Um, your compost is, is constantly um, put together neatly. You have constantly have a nice deep litter. So high carbon material like sawdust or hood chip or, or any of anything that's high carbon ensure that you always got a nice thick layer because that helps to balance out the the nitrogen in the in the, in the <clears throat> excuse me in the mix um and what that does is a, a, there's no smell in such a system and that also then doesn't attract those those pests um from taking up residence in your garden so as long as you've got your proper you follow best practice um hygiene uh, you shouldn't have problems with um, with uh, rodents and that. The only time I've had problems with them was when we were also throwing we, uh, meat byproducts into the, the coop system, and that then attracted um, rodents. But once we stopped doing that, then it completely sorted itself out. Mom, and then there any other more questions? There's a question about what you feed your chickens. Okay, so at the moment, I'm still using the commercial grain. The unfortunate thing is that um, up until actually a couple of months ago, I went, was the first time I found a non-GMO supplier. Um, I think, I, I'm not sure if anyone else has, has better experience with this, but it seems like our feed industry is only starting to now slowly go the more regenerative non-GMO route. Um, but I'm still using commercial grain because it's accessible. Most pet stores stock it. Um, unfortunately, it's GMO positive. But you've got to start somewhere. I believe we can't be purists when you go into any any sustainability, any regeneration. It's a it's a scale that we work along. You know, we start off maybe five percent regenerative, and we're working our way towards 95 percent, um, and that gives people the room to actually get into this journey rather than oh you got to be completely organic and non-gmo from the beginning um we've got to one of the principles of permaculture is to obtain a yield and oftentimes the best and simplest ways to obtain a yield is if you follow industry standards to start off with um and and get a, get a return get a get a result get something back from the effort that you put in and then you can start to experiment and start to find the alternatives but then at least you have a reference to work from Excellent. Mum, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, pause uh, the questions for you at the moment because I would like for us to move on to Natasha. Um, that was really interesting, very 
thanks very much, Imran. Um, I'm hoping that we are going to have lots of time at the end for more discussion. Um, Natasha, uh, thanks very much for joining us this morning. Nat Natasha is from the Sustainability Institute and will be speaking to us on the same topic. Natasha, please go ahead. Sure, morning. Morning, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you for organizing this. I, yeah, I'm a student of sustainable development at the Sustainability Institute. And for about five or six years now, I have had pet rabbits. So I'm not gonna be speaking about farming rabbits for meat, um, but I am gonna be speaking about keeping pet rabbits in various spaces. Um, what it takes to keep them healthy <laughs> and happy and how I've integrated them and their food and manure into my garden system. So maybe uh, Victoria might share some pictures on a shared screen that I sent through and I'll just speak to them. So, <laughs> so as you can see, um, yeah, there's a lot of poop in this picture, but rabbits eat um, 80 to 85 percent hay. And hay is different to straw. Um, I just want everyone to know that because straw is, it's kind of like the fiber stalk of maybe oats or teff or something like that, but it, it actually doesn't have any nutrients. So um, if you are considering buying feed for rabbits, um, yeah, you have to look for oat hay, teff grass, uh, these things. Um, straw is great for bedding but it's, it's not nutritious at all. Rabbits will chew on it, but it's not nutritious. Um, and yeah, they eat quite a lot. They eat just about their body size in hay every day. So it's, it's imperative to give them um, yeah, a constant supply of fresh hay. Um, because yeah, so rabbits work like this. They have, they have a little gut system that needs to stay constantly moving. And if they stop eating for any amount of time, um, their gut will actually stop functioning and you're going to have a situation where you need to take a, a bunny to a vet or you're going to come home to a sad situation. So that's probably the most important thing I can say with bunnies um, is constant supply of hay. Um, I get my hay from um, equine feed people who supply straw bales and horse feed. Um, a bale generally goes anywhere between 60 rand for oat hay to maybe 110 rand for teff grass. Um, and it lasts a long time. These bales are really densely packed. Um, it can last anywhere from a month and a half to two and a half months um, for my three rabbits. Um, yes, so, so maybe something to mention as well is um, I have three rabbits. Two of them are female and one is male, um, but they're all spayed. <laughs> So there's, there's a huge network of rabbits, um, a huge rabbit rescue network in Cape Town. And it's great to have unspayed rabbits because you don't have an uncontrollable breeding situation. Um, yeah, so there's, I mean, it's really, um, they, so they're great urban pets. And, and, and one of the reasons is that they don't need a huge amount of space. They, um, they are diggers. So in any situation, you can see, in the top right hand corner of this picture, um, right of the greens, there's, you can see wire underneath the soil. It's really important to contain rabbits um, safely. I always joke about them being in like high security prison, but it is for their own protection and safety because a lot of animals want to eat rabbits. Um, once they escape, they are really a pain to try catch if they get under a, a garden shed or yeah it's just it's a it's a real nightmare if you if you don't prepare your cage um, to contain your rabbits adequately from the get-go um, they can be quite a nightmare you definitely don't want rabbits free roaming in your garden space um, especially where you're planting vegetables they're extremely destructive they eat constantly and they really do have a taste for for almost all human vegetables so <laughs> So yeah, um, I'll speak about how I, yeah. So I, I have my rabbits in a cage on one part of my vegetable garden actually, but they are highly secured in there. And um, what I found with my rabbits, yeah, maybe if you can switch to the picture with the chicken wire underneath the soil, uh, Vicky. Uh, I think it's the third picture. Yeah, you can see there. Um, rabbits aren't necessarily gonna squish through really small spaces. So 
that should be adequate. You can see poops for scale. <laughs> um, so yes, back to their diet, 80% hay, 80, 85% hay. Um, you can feed your rabbits pellets. Um, it does help with keeping them um, fit. I generally just buy pellets from the store, um, but I feed them a, a really small amount, a small handful between the three rabbits every day. They don't even need to eat it every day. As long as your rabbits have access to fresh hay and, and daily greens. So maybe Vicky, if you can move to the pictures of the seedlings or the small, um, the next picture, yeah, there we go. This is a picture of a, a bed I have in my vegetable garden. Um, you can see there's chives and things around the side. I maybe just want to speak a little bit about which greens rabbits can and really shouldn't eat. <laughs> um, rabbits are, um, they can eat almost all human greens and herbs like thyme, parsley, spinaches. Um, do be cautious when feeding them uh, lettuce um, and cabbage. Um, lettuce and cabbage, lettuce has a really high water content and it can disturb their stomachs and they, they have obviously very fragile digestive systems and cabbage, <laughs> as with humans, it can make them gassy and it can upset their stomachs too. So if you, um, yeah, I would really suggest avoiding those things. They don't eat things like onions. They don't eat any, um, yeah, they don't, they won't eat like citrusy things. They do eat some fruits. Um, they'll eat some carrots as a treat, apples. Um, rabbits love eating some banana. So another green I use that I have in my vegetable garden is um, they love banana leaves, which is great because bananas grow quite prolifically where I stay. Um, so there's, there's lots of ways. Maybe Vicky, if you can go to that last picture, which looks like a bed of weeds. Um, this is on the edge of one of my beds where I grow rhubarb. And um, you can see it's kind of just a mixture of, of different weeds that have popped up. And, and I keep them there because they hold my, the wall of the bed in place. Um, and these weeds are, are great because they, they almost grow as fodder. I just pick them and the rabbits love them. Um, any grass, plants like nasturtium. Yeah, I mean, I think if, if you are planning on keeping rabbits, um, it would be a good idea to join like the Bunny Huggers Facebook page. They have a lot of guides for exactly what rabbits can and can't eat. Um, but generally garden weeds are great, which is one of the, yeah, the sources of, <laughs> if I do any weeding, the rabbits are the first point where those weeds go. And then Vicky, if you can maybe go to the picture of the poop on my hand. <laughs> There we go. So I just want to say, obviously, because rabbits have such fragile digestive systems, um, the, how you can just ensure that your rabbit is healthy is feeding them tons of hay. You can see here really healthy poop. It should crumble quite, quite easily <laughs> in your hand. Um, the nice thing about rabbit poop is it really isn't smelly. Um, I, I use it, I litter it directly onto my plants. It doesn't burn them. You don't need to compost it. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's really great as a fertilizer. Um, you can dig it into the soil or just sprinkle it over. Um, it's obviously also really high in, in fibers. Um, so, uh, yeah. So what I do in my rabbit cage is um, rabbits are quite easy to litter train to some extent. Like if you continuously put their poops in one area or if you have a tray, if you're living in a smaller space like an apartment or you have a small courtyard or something like that you can put out a litter tray and your rabbits will continuously use that um, i place my litter tray underneath where i feed them hay because they like to eat and poop at the same time and this is really effective because you can then catch the manure and the urine along with the, the fallen pieces of straw that the rabbits have eaten and you can either compost that or you can add it directly to your plants directly on top of the soil. Um, so it's, it's just an easy way to contain their mess and also catch um, your fertility and be able to move it around quite easily. In my space, I have a slightly bigger cage. So they, um, they just poop in generally a pile, <laughs> which I rake up and I either compost or move it directly to my vegetable garden. Um, yeah. Are there any questions? Um, could I ask if we uh, go back to the speaker view that we can see yeah. the 
uh, group chat. Thank you very much for that, Vicky. Um, are there any questions specific for Natasha? That was great. Thank you so much, Natasha. Um, I'm just going to go through the chat box. Do you see? Um, is there any questions specific to, to rabbits that people would like to ask? You can either put up your hand um, or type in the, the chat box. Maybe if I can just add a small two cents. Um, yeah, rabbits are really great urban pets. Obviously, they don't bark and they don't stray far. <laughs> they can't climb anything. Um, but rabbits are not ideal to keep around small or young children just because of the cuteness appeal and they do, they can get injured or they can harm children if they get picked up unnecessarily. They're, they're prey animals, so the feeling of getting lifted up is not something they enjoy. Thank you, Natasha. That's an important point. <laughs> I'm going to open it up for general discussion. So um, I think we've had some really useful and very wise input from Imran and Natasha. Um, I'm aware there's a number of people within this group uh, who have um, who have some important experiences um, that they might want to share. And I'm going to ask the people, please put up their hands. Um, I'm going to take Erica first. Erica, please go ahead. Uh, uh, thanks, Imran and Natasha, for that introduction to the animals. Um, I wanted to just add, because I keep chickens as well, uh, and I've had to go through um, experiencing myself all the different predators and how to handle them. So just a couple of, of tips um, for chicks always have a separate small space for the mom and, and chicks with full chicken mesh and at least a 40% shade plot. Uh, make friends with any snake, snake keepers uh, and, and keep, get snake poo to deter rats. You'll find the areas where the rats are always coming in. And you just put poop there. So it's not like you have to line snake poo around your entire property. Rats like to always follow a, a, a similar path. Uh, as far as the flying predators, is we've got fish, eagles, mountain buzzard, and various hawks flying around. Um, the chickens must have a dense thicket or a hedge and a covered area to get away from them. Or if they're free ranging, like Imran says, the best place is in a food forest area. Uh, so the chickens always have somewhere where they can get away uh, from the, the flying predators. <coughs> Uh, be very aware that a, a chicken tractor or tunnel in a small area does become cruel. Uh, don't keep chickens in, in tiny, tiny areas. Make sure that you can move them around from space to space if you're keeping them enclosed in, in smaller areas. Uh, mongoose and caracal are other two, um, believe it or not, um, predators that you will find in urban spaces. Um, so it's important to have a secure place to shut chickens away at night. And uh, a mongoose can fit through the tiniest space, smaller than a, a tennis ball space. So you seriously have to, I've found chicken mesh is always your <laughs> go-to <laughs> for, for securing a space. Uh, and as far as a mongoose is concerned, um, they actually prefer eggs. So I will always leave out an egg or two for the mongoose to have. So that he won't kill the chicken if he's got a, an egg to eat. And I normally find problems with that uh, in the breeding season. So it's probably females looking for food desperately for their kits. Um, and the other thing is the mongoose is going to eat rats and voles and keep a cobra away. So you don't want to kill the mongoose. Everything has a place. And if you run things the right way and link things up correctly, everything will work in harmony. Uh, chickens poop very high nitrogen. So either dry it first before putting it anywhere near your plants or stick it into a compost. It's a great start of compost. Uh, and like Natasha said, rabbit, rabbit poop can go direct, but not their bedding. Their bedding must go to the compost heap. Yeah, I'm done. Shut. Thank you, Erica. Do you want to ask your fly larva question? I saw I missed that one in the beginning. 
Oh, uh, yeah, I was just wondering if anybody had, um, because chickens are predominantly, believe it or not, carnivores, they like prefer to eat meat. Uh, I actually throw all my meat scraps to them, and I don't have a rat problem because I've got, uh, uh, I'm lucky enough to have a, a couple of snakes around. Um, has anybody tried feeding uh, chickens with fly larvae? I know there's black fly larvae that's being used uh, commercially now, so you should be able to get hold of it quite easily. Um, and chickens would love that. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, can I, I respond to that? Yes, go for it, Imran. So, okay, now yeah, there's another voice. Ibam, go ahead and I will ask the person to put up their hand and then I'll go to them next. Okay, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I kept uh, and farmed black soldier fly larva previously. Uh, there's so many setups you can find online. It's super simple. You need like a, a little plastic box and you just got to get the larva from a, from a breeder. I know in the Western Cape, the two places I got from was Stodals in Belleville. Um, there's a reptile. A little section there and you'd find some people on Gumtree and then there's a large commercial producer in Philippi called AgriProtein. In the beginning when they were starting out you could actually go and buy um, lava feed they either ground up or whole lava um, but then uh, the strategy changed and they're more commercial now so they only supply to an export market um, but it was uh, fascinating to see the the commercial setup if you keep in or if you wanted to farm um, black soldier fly lava at home uh, it only really works in in our climate in in the, in the warmer months. In the winter months, if it's an open outdoor setup, they kind of just disappear. They go dormant. Um, so if you want to keep them all throughout the year for our winter season, you do need to have them in a contained area, and you've got to have climate controls like heating and and such kind of thing in order to keep them all all year round. In terms of our, our usual flies, not the black soldier fly, um, I've tried before just taking like a dead animal, like roadkill, hanging it in the tree next to, near to the chickens, and then the flies lay the eggs and then the larva drops to the ground. That's a really cool um, way to, to get boost their protein um, in the larva that falls to the ground. Um, but yeah, uh, what I've got to learn from agri-protein was that they recommended not more than 15% of the diet should come from, from this uh, larva because it's quite fatty. Um, so if they ate too much of it, they would actually um, yeah, have complications, health complications. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I also thought it was a, a really cool um, solution, um, but you can't really replace the entire um, diet intake with just the, the lava. Um, but it is really simple to, to farm yourself. Super, super simple. Thanks very much, Iman. I'm going to quickly go to Natasha. Um, and I've noted Buyani's hand. Natasha, do you want to speak a little bit about the rabbit coops um, and uh, some of the questions that have come up around that? And then I'm going to go to Buyani. And if anyone else wants to make a contribution, please put up your hand in the chat box. Thank you. Um, hi, yeah, thank you uh, for the question about the coops and multi-levels. Um, rabbits need space. Um, traditionally, you see rabbits in pet shops and things, and you think that they're okay with staying in a tiny cage. Those are carrier cages, and they're not adequate for rabbits, for keeping rabbits in. Um, rabbits need some space to roam. Um, what I've seen people do is they might have a coop where rabbits stay, and they have, like, um, they have... Um, they have time out in a space where they are supervised. Um, if you have not that much floor space to dedicate to a three by three meter coop, you can build um, a little layer in with a bridge so that there's the floor layer, a little bridge for them to climb up. As long as the rabbits have space to move in adequately, um, that's the most important part. You need to look at your own space um, um, and, and see what... Uh, yeah, what space you have to meet the rabbit's spatial requirements. Thanks, Natasha. Buyani. Uh, Im Imran did mention something about cats, but I didn't pick it up. Was in our house, we've got about three cats, and I'm worried for my because I'm busy now building. I've got the foundation for my chicken coop, so and it's a three by three. I had Erica also mentioning something about 
they should have enough space to move or run. So a three by three space is not too small to be keeping ch chickens. And then the main one is, are cats really a threat to chickens or not? Thank you, Yanni. Imran, will you go first? And then I'll ask Erica if she has any other things she would like to add. Okay, okay, cool. Um, so for the space in three by three, that's nine square meters, you could probably fit about then nine birds in that space. Obviously the more space they have, the, uh, the better for, for, the, for the state of being, you know, for, uh, the, the less stress. But one meter squared per chicken is kind of like the general minimum that I use. Um, though just to note, I mean, an indus industry standard for meat production, but obviously it's not, I'm um, sure many of many would agree, it's not the most ethical way to keep animals, but just, just for, for comparison, um, it's about 10 birds per meter squared. And this is not in the battery farm cage setup, this is in the open um, house pen style. But yeah, so that, that's, that's more than enough space, I'd say, for nine birds, Vianney. And then in terms of the rats, I think as, I'm um, sorry, the, the cats, as Erika was saying, I mean, whenever you construct your, your coop space, um, you do want to make sure it's nice and secure. So like your chicken wire, or I would recommend the welded mesh, galvanized welded mesh. I find the chicken wire tends to just disintegrate after a year or two. Um, but make sure it's nice and secure. But once they mature, like I've never seen a, a chicken not defend itself against a cat. Um, and they're quite vicious. They're quite, they, they're very much like little gangsters. Um, so yeah, I think they should be fine. Unless it's a, it's a, a very, um, uh, maybe the health is compromised with the bird or something like, like that. They're quite feisty and will defend themselves. Thanks, Imran. I've never thought of chickens as little gangsters. Um, I'm going to make that adjustment. Uh, Erika, is there anything that you would like to add? Yeah, they are total little gangsters and they're way more intelligent than you think. Um, the three by three meter space is something that I would say is uh, somewhere where they'd, you'd keep them shut away safe uh, and then you'd have a, a smaller space where they'd go into at night time. Um, but I found with chickens, like I say, they're intelligent. Um, if you want to introduce your cats and dogs to chickens, introduce them uh, when you've got a, a broody hen with chicks and she will sort them out one time. They will never look at a chicken again. Um, I'm, I've got bantams, so I've got tiny ones and I've seen them sort out. You know, I've seen the cat running past and a broody hen after the cat. Um, the other important thing is they, they will, if they've kept in one place for three weeks and they know that this is where they get their food and this is where they uh, are coming to sleep at night, uh, you can then let them go in the daytime and they will go and eat and clean out the bugs in all the little nooks and crannies or everywhere um, and come back at night. So you can have more than one space for them uh, where you can move them around. That's always obviously preferable rather than having one small space. Thanks, Erica. Can I add one more, one more point? Go for it, Imran. Um, yeah, I completely agree. Like the more they're moving around um, and not concentrated in one space, the better. Um, though for those who, who really can't, who don't have access to more space, what you can do is in your coop area, go vertical. So make more um, layers of, of platforms, like maybe uh, roosts um, at different vertical layers. That gives them a bit more space within the same space if you if you get what I mean, you, you start to open up a little bit more um, surface area for them. So it, it gives them the, the feeling of having much more space than just having one ground layer. Thanks, Emma. Are there any other contributions from this group? Anyone who's had experiences with small animals in an urban environment that people would like to share? You can put your hand up in the chat box. Natasha, go ahead while we look for some more hands. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, I forgot to mention, and Imran mentioned this too, small animals aren't um, great at regulating their temperature because their bodies are just smaller. Um, and, and rabbits too can really suffer quite intensely and also die um, in, in heat. So it's really important to cover these little animals with, um, in a shelter that has shade cloth or adequate shady spaces. 
with rabbits, even during um, intensely hot days, I put out like an ice pad that you can buy with checkers <laughs> that they lie on um, because you will lose an animal to heat, a small animal. Thanks, Natasha. I see there's a question about uh, whether you leave your chickens to go free range in the veg garden. Um, Imram and Erika, if you could comment on that. Um, okay, so I would suggest, um, I mean, you definitely can, especially if you time it nicely. They tend to want to go for the, the bugs first. Um, but I mean, you've got to be, you've got to manage it quite, quite effectively. I would rather recommend you let them free range in the vegetable garden once the season's over so that they can take care of the, any residual um, um, crop matter that's there and clean out any of the pests and that. Um, that. That for me worked the best. Um, but yeah, I, I, when I did let them just free range in the veg garden, even if you left them for a couple of hours too long, they would <laughs> zap the entire vegetable garden. Thanks, Imam. Erica, anything you would like to add? I totally agree with that. Um, uh, it's one of the reasons why I've got bantams, is because they're less destructive. Uh, they don't dig such deep holes and dust baths. Um, and I always make the mistake because my chickens are mainly free range uh, and they are total gangsters. They take an entire farm, the, the garage. The, uh, I've had chicks lay eggs, uh, a chicken lay eggs next to my computer, a chick hatch in my office before. So that's how far they take an egg. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's it. Thank you, Erica. Sorry, we missed the, 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 la the last point you made. So you said you, you, your chickens go everywhere. Yeah, they go everywhere. And if you leave them too long in a vegetable patch, they will take it out. Uh, don't let them free range in springtime, especially if you've got heirloom seeds and that, and you've let everything reseed itself because they will take out all the baby plants. Thanks, Erica Imran. So we've heard about uh, some bantam chickens and some silky chickens. Imran, I forgot what was the other term that you used for the, the silkies. Just remind us. Sorry, can you hear me? Um, the other term for the silkies, uh, uh, bantam, yeah, bantam silkies is, is what I had. Okay. Is there any other experience in the group with, with other types of Well, Natasha, I think, did you tell us what type of rabbits you had? Yeah, so I'll, I'll post a link right now in the group. Um, my rabbits are, um, one is a dwarf rabbit, they're all rescues. So, um, yeah, I mean, getting rabbits from a rescue organization is great, just generally because they are spayed when you get them. Um, yeah, breeding rabbits is not a, um, it's it's not a great idea um, if you're doing it and you're not sure how to. It often becomes uncontrollable, and then you end up with people releasing rabbits in in parks and public spaces, and it's yeah, it's not great. So I have posted a link if you are thinking about getting rabbits. Otherwise, you can speak to me directly, and I can link you with the rescuer. Thank you very much, Natasha. Uh, there's a question: If anyone else on the group has experience with other small animals. Anyone else who would like to make a contribution or to ask a question? Um, while we wait for questions to come, can I make a, a point on breeds? Yes, please. Imran, please go ahead and then I'm going to hand over to Erica. Okay. Um, so in terms of breeds for those who are looking to get into chicken farming, um, it depends on, on what your goal is. So if you're looking for like a commercial setup, then you want to use some of the commercial breeds that's known to produce quite a lot. So often your, your Loman Brown, I'm going to type it in the group, um, and your Loman Ranges, those are, are good egg layers. And then for meat production, you're looking at the Ross or Cobb breeds. Um, but if you're keeping it in the, in the home garden, um, ideally, it's, it's, it's better to go for our indigenous breeds like your Boschfelders. I know Erika has Boschfelder Bantams, um, if I'm not mistaken. Your 
cuckoo. So you put your strum cuckoo. So these are all breeds that have been bred here in South Africa, and they're very hardy, very tough. But they're also good egg layers and good um, meat producers. Um, things like your leg horns as well. But yeah, the, between the two, as a pattern, my suggestion is for the home, um, go for some of the indigenous breeds because they're just much, they're going to give you less trouble in terms of health and, and ability to manage them. They also tend to be a bit more aggressive scratches, so good for free range and good for if you've got them in a compost system. Um, they, they really do the job of, of scratching about the compost and turning it around. Thanks, Imran. Erica, and then I'm going to give the last word to Vuyani. We're all thinking along the same lines. Uh, also talking about the breeding side uh, of chickens is um, uh, if you can keep a rooster do, they are, uh, number one, they will uh, increase the egg production of the hens. <laughs> Um, and they're most helpful in, in, in warning them of, of predators and, and helping them to get to safety. So uh, it definitely is a, a, a gangster thing. Um, and always keep your original rooster, your male rooster, and, and, and uh, get rid of or, or eat the, the, um, the, young, the young ones um, just from a genetic point of view to try to keep your lines. Uh, your breeding lines uh, fresh. Uh, if you allow too much interbreeding, then you start getting horrible things happening. Thank you, Erica. Buyani. Yeah. Now, for me, then at, at what age, uh, in terms of size, okay, how do I start? Do I start with maybe uh, two weeks, three weeks old, or was I just one for eggs, mostly for now at home? Thanks, Boyani. Uh, Imam, do you have an answer for Boyani? Yeah, sure. Um, so it depends on if you want the eggs right now. <laughs> then, then what you do is you purchase birds that are at point of lay, so they're ready to go to start laying eggs. It'll take a couple of days to adjust to your space before they start laying. And also now in winter production, egg production slows down a bit because it's a bit colder. But if you want them to start laying as soon as possible, then you buy mature birds, which are usually around, I'd say five to six months old already, um, depending on the breed, of course. Um, but then they're, then they're at the point of lay. If you've got the time to wait, um, it's also helpful to get them to get younger chicks because then they grow up knowing you, knowing your, your environment, knowing your surroundings. Um, so, so yeah, uh, in, if you're going for meat production, then you want to get, get them as young as possible. Uh, day old chicks is the standard. Um, yeah, I hope I answered the question. Thanks, Imran. And there's a question about if you have recommendations on where to buy chickens around the Cape Town area. Okay, I'll drop the links for a couple of our suppliers. Um, there's a cool guy named Clint. He's out in Tukai. He's actually is his young son's a little chicken business. He's about nine years old, so it's really cool to go and support him there. And there's like quite a lot of our indigenous uh, breeds. And then I know there's a farm out in Cryfontaine. Uh, I haven't yet been there, but I know they, they do stock a lot of uh, variety. There's also, um, for silk, isn't that <laughs> someone who's close, living close to um, Erika in a, in, a, in a area there. Good friend of Erika. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, those are kind of the main places where I've, I've purchased from. But I'll, I'll drop the, the contact details in the group, in the chat. Thank you, Iman. Erika, is there anything that you would like to add to, to that? And uh, just to say, uh, Natasha and Imran, please put all of these links into the WhatsApp group as well. Uh, and uh, when this video, this recording is, is ready, if we could get a link into the WhatsApp group too, not just we'll on be. Facebook, because most people don't have access. Excellent. Erica, sure. Imran, and Natasha, thank you very much for this morning. Um, I think there's been uh, a lot of really good uh, suggestions and discussions uh, around small animal rearing. Um, I want to, to thank everyone who, who's participated for coming. Um, we will make sure that this, uh, this recording is put up on Facebook and circulated in the, the WhatsApp group. And I want to end off the session by saying I hope you have a good Friday um, and a good weekend. Thank you very much, everyone. Oh, thanks, everyone.
Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Bye. You. Enjoy your time. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. That was amazing. Mm.